What's up everybody? My name is Russ with rwgresearch.com. Welcome back to another video. So this is uh, sort of a um, uh, JWN update slash I'm going to show you how to measure inductance, capacitance, um, self-capacitance I should say, and self-inductance of this coil or really any other coil. This applies to pretty well all inductors. Um, I was actually having a pretty hard time measuring the inductance of this coil and I wanted to know its capacitance. So in order to do that, I went through many methods and I thought I would show you guys what method I use that worked the best, which ones that didn't work at all, and actually how to do that. So it's going to be sort of lengthy, but it's going to be, uh, we're going to be using the oscilloscope, we're going to be using a couple other meters, and we're going to be doing some math. And I'm not going to actually be doing the math, I'm going to calculate it out for you and actually just give you the answers and show you how this is done. So ideally you want to start out with an inductor that you know its value. So that's a pretty small inductor. You can get a, uh, a size comparison, right? I'm standing right next to this one. You can see how much bigger this one is. Um, and so the idea here is to understand the inductance of this coil and I want to know its self-resonant frequency and we're going to be the determining its self-resonant frequency and using that actually as um, part of our understanding of how to calculate the inductance. Um, none of my meters will read the inductance of this. It is way too big. So doing it by hand using the oscilloscope and the uh, proper methods are about the only way. And I found that using the self-resonant frequency of this coil, I could calculate the inductance by adding extra capacitance to the coil and determining what its capacitance value is plus what the um, um, added capacitive value and then doing the math behind that. So let's jump right in. Let me show you what I got on the bench, what we're going to be using today, and we'll go from there. So here's what we have on the bench. Um, for this test, I've got my LRC meter. This is a handheld meter. I've had this meter for quite some time. It works pretty well. Um, I can't complain too much, but I'm not so convinced that it works properly, to be honest. But um, that's okay. It does work for what we're going to do right now. Um, I've also got that small inductor here so we can just test it and make sure it's right. I'm not going to do that in this video, but I recommend what you should do as a procedure is actually test what you can do on a known inductor and then kind of go from there. Now these small inductors, the self-resonant frequency is going to be very, very high probably. So you may not even be able to do such a thing, but on this very large inductor, the, the self-resonant frequency is so low that it just makes perfect sense to do what I'm going to do on this big coil. Um, I've got some batteries. I've got a mercury reed switch or a mercury, uh, mercury switch here, which we're going to use to ring the coil so we can get a clean signal um, without too much arcing. Then we've got a set of capacitors here and another one here. And we're basically going to use these capacitors to determine the self-capacitance and inductance of this coil. By using additive capacitance, we can deduce exactly what we're trying to uh, measure in this coil, um, changing the self-resonant frequency and doing the math behind that. We've got an oscilloscope here. Um, it doesn't have to be a fancy one. It just needs to be able to measure the phase shift, or you can do that by hand. Um, we're going to be using the phase shift method for this because it's the one that worked the best. And uh, yeah, so let me um, take all the measurements for these capacitors and I'm going to try to take measurements of this coil. And I'm going to write them on the whiteboard and I'm going to explain to you what we're going to do. Okay, so I've taken my meter and on the 10 kilohertz setting, I've measured all the capacitors and the coil. The coil shows it's about 395 picofarad. And then I've measured the actual value of my capacitor to get the most accurate measurement I can according to what we got here because you know these capacitors are all some percentage off of what their stated value are. So that'll help us if we measure them. You don't have to do that, um, but it's a good idea. Now I'm picking values in the range that I know that this thing's going to resonate at. If you're too far out one way or the other, you're either not going to make enough difference or you're going to make so much difference you're not going to be able to see your measurement. So I've, I've, I've selected quite a few. What do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six different values just to get us a really good plotted data value set to make sure that what we're actually measuring is what it really is. So that's what I did so far. Let's move on to the next step. 
All right, so there are many different methods for actually measuring the inductance of a coil. Um, the best method that I found right now for this particular coil is measuring a phase shift between the coil and a load resistor. And I'm going to kind of explain that to you. Um, the other methods is using a time constant where you charge the coil and you take a um, like 10 to 90 percent, you do some math on that, or you can take 63 percent of the whole curve and do some math on that. However, those methods uh, either didn't work well or I did the math wrong. But as far as I can tell, uh, they don't, they did not measure correctly. So I figured the best method, um, um, thanks to the guys on the forums for throwing out some suggestions, we decided to try this one. So what I got here is I've got a signal generator, I've got the coil, I've got a load resistor, and then everything's grounded. So basically the um, signal generator is oscillating between this side of the circuit. We're measuring the um, voltage across R1, and we're measuring the voltage across the signal generator. And so what we're looking for, okay, if, uh, let's use this because it's actually blue, and we're going to use green for one even though we're using yellow over there, okay. So channel one, all right, uh, if we look at the, um, I'll just draw a curve. So we're going to see basically a sinusoidal wave like this. All right, and then we're going to tune, okay, we're going to fix this resistor value. And again, through experimentation, um, I figured out which value worked best, okay. In this case, the coil resistance is um, pretty high. I didn't write it down, so over there, I'll get it in a second. And then I'll let you know these two values in a second. But basically, what we're trying to do, okay, is we're going to be seeing a phase shift, okay. And what we want to do is we want the phase shift between here and here, all right. We want that value to be negative, all right. We want the R1 value here to be negative 45. Okay, now I can actually measure this exactly on the uh, oscilloscope, but um, I'm going to show you how to do that and I'll give you the value of these in just a second. So I've written down the uh, resistance values here. Um, I've tried, I've got here 200k for R1, I've tried all the way up to 6 mega ohm, and both of those actually were pretty good. But if you go too low, if you go below like the resistance of the coil, things just do not work well at all. So the coil resistance is 45.71 K ohms and the value of this resistor, we're going to actually measure, measure it, but I've got about 200 K. Um, so the equation for this, once you figure out the phase shift, what you do is you set this up, tune the frequency to achieve this phase shift. Once you achieve this phase shift, okay, then you can go in here and you can take R1 plus the coil resistance divided by 2 times pi times the frequency that you're at. Now this is actually sort of tricky. It's actually kind of hard to get exactly this 45 degree. Um, so through all the methods, the, um, the method that usually works, which is the time constant, is a lot easier to measure than this. But in this case, this was the most accurate for such a big coil. So this is the one we're going to use. So let's go to the bench and I'll actually set this experiment up so we can actually look at it. All right, before I get the camera on the tripod, I'm going to show you what we got here. So I've got the signal generator connected on one side of the coil and the other side of the resistor, according to our diagram right there. And then that's going to the signal generator in here. So the ground is here. Now channel one on the oscilloscope is on one side of the function generator to ground. Now I don't have ground leads on here because it's internally connected to the scope on these probes, so I don't need to worry about that here. The other side, or channel 2 I should say, the other side of the coil is connected between the resistor and the coil. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sending a signal in through the signal generator, we're going to be measuring the signal generator, and we're going to be measuring the um, resistance here, and we're going to be looking at the phase difference. So I just wanted to show you how it was set up so that you know exactly what we're doing. Again, just like that. All right, so I've done a few different uh, resistor values, and if you're not careful, you'll get too low, and you won't be able to read the signal too high, and things don't work. So I've taken two measurements, and I'm going to show you what I've done. Um, first thing you're going to do is set your signal generator 
to sine wave. So I've got this set to sine wave. Um, the output settings is high Z right now, and it's at about uh, uh, 1.2 volts positive. So it's about 2.4 volts output. This thing only goes up to 5, uh, 2 point, no, this only goes up to about 5 volt. Oh, 2.4 volt. Okay. So it, on this particular scope, I'm actually doing an average. All right, so I've went to my acquisition and I've got an average of 64. Um, if I if I run the oscilloscope right now, okay, and I turn this average or go back to sample, you can see how the signal's pretty noisy, and it, this coil is actually picking up a lot of background noise. So in order to fix that, I'm going to the average, and I'm going to bump it up to 64 is probably plenty. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to average out that signal and give you a much cleaner signal. Now, I will tell you it's very difficult to actually get this to work on an average when you're tuning the frequency. Um, because if you go back to the frequency and actually try to change it, you can see how long it takes for that waveform to change. So it's best to get it close and then come back and set this to an average. So we're going to get it close, um, and then we'll go back and average that. The other thing you need to do is, um, in my measurements, all right, I've already got this turned on. I've got uh, t, uh, um, I've got channel two, so uh, in channel one, I'm measuring the phase difference right here. Okay. So I'm just going to go and get it close to 45. It's actually pretty close with the noise. So I'm going to adjust the frequency and try to get that more towards the um, the 45. And it, it's, sometimes you have to use your cursors to measure this. So right now it's jumping around. It's actually measuring in the wrong spot. So it's not not it's not real easy to to actually get this right. That's pretty close. Let's go to the uh, uh, acquire and put the average up a couple. Put it at 64 is enough, it seems like. We'll get this thing to kind of average out. Now, on this oscilloscope, um, if you do adjust anything on the frequency, so if I adjusted this up a little, I can actually just change the time base and change it back, and it will actually re-average, and then you got to wait a little bit for it to, to steady. I'm pretty close. We're at 46. Let's go down in frequency just a little... We'll reset it so it re-averages it. So it's it's a fraction low. Let's go back up just a few. We want to get it as close as we can to exactly negative 45. So you can see the yellow voltage is leading and the blue voltage is lagging. That's what you want. Oh. All right, I'm going to keep fiddling with this until I get it exactly where I want it, then I'll show you. All right, so you can see here, um, you can see it, it's pretty darn close. Right there is pretty well spot on. So it's at 31.2 hertz. So what we're going to do is right now I've actually got a different valued resistor on there, not the uh, 2.168 meg. I actually have a 600 and 48k so we're just going to do the the simple calculation we're going to take our coil resistance which is 45 um, 710 and we're going to add it to the resistance which is 648 so 648k all right so there's our our number now we're going to take the Calculation for inductance, which is that resistance value. I'm just going to re-punch it in because this calculator has been giving me some strange fits. All right, and we're going to divide that by 2 um, times pi times our frequency. So our frequency is 31.2 hertz. So 31.2. Now... In my scenario, this frequency is extremely low. This is pretty easy to do. It's actually harder to do with such low frequency. 
um, but in this case, you know, that's a really low frequency for a uh, for this calculation. But so we got about 35, 38. So that's the inductance value. That's in Henry. So 3,538 Henry. So let's go look at the other measurements I took and see uh, see what we can see from that. All right, so I have taken four measurements. Now, it's a, always a good idea when you're doing stuff like this to take many measurements over many different ranges and then use the average so you can just get a close approximate to what you're looking at. Um, the error tolerance and looking for the phase angle, it's pretty, you know, you got to really nail exactly 45, negative 45, or else this won't quite work out. So I took a many different variable, values here. So I took the 2.168 meg, I took a 217.6K, a 648K, and a 1.67 uh, meg, okay? I've got 5,701, or 5, uh, 3,284, or 48. So look how, look how big difference this is. That's a big difference. Um, <clears throat> it's a pretty big difference here, too. And then the next one, we got 35, 38, and 5, uh, 5,038. So... What I did is I took the average here, and we got right at uh, 4,381 Henry. Okay, 4,381 Henry. This is my final value. So now that I've done that, I feel pretty good that that's probably close. However, I want to double check that. So how do you double check that? Well, what you can do is you can find the self-resonant frequency of the coil. Now for us, in this situation, it's pretty easy because the self-resonant frequency is pretty low. Now, if you got a really small coil, it may be in the in the megahertz range, which is going to be pretty hard to do this calculation. But for this coil, it works really well. So um, let me draw some stuff up on the board, and I'll show you exactly how we're going to do that. All right, so now what we're going to do is find the self-resonant frequency of this coil. What does that really mean? Well, don't forget that a regular inductor, okay, is not just an inductor. Ideal inductor is just the inductance. That's not the case here. The case here is actually we have capacitance, all right, technically between every single one of these windings, okay, and as a whole they add up to a capacitance value. So in a resonant circuit, you have, and this is a parallel resonant circuit, okay, you have the inductance and you have the capacitance here, okay. The resistance is somewhere located in this circuit, usually drawn like this, I believe, but we're not going to worry about that for the moment. Uh, the reason, well, I'll get to that in a second. So what we're going to be doing is current is going to be flowing, okay, back and forth inside this resonant circuit. All right, this way and this way. Okay, so current is going to be going one way and then the other way, and it's going to be passing current from the capacitance to the inductance, and that is what a resonant circuit is. So in this case, the capacitance is actually what's the space in between this winding and things around it, okay, and the inductance is the, the induced, okay, reaction between the windings of the coil. So in this case, we don't even have a capacitor, okay? The capacitor is in the coil. Now, if you have a very small capacitance, um, it's going to be pretty difficult to measure in a small inductance. Now, in our case, we've got approximately 4,381 Henry, right? But our capacitance value, according to measurement, is uh, 395 picofarad. Okay, so I put the formula for resonance up here. If you want to find the frequency, it's like this. If you want to find the capacitance, it's like this. All right, in this case, we actually have the L and the C. So if we do this formula, this calculation, we can calculate out what the resonant frequency should be. Now, to double check this, what we're going to actually do is we're going to take um, another capacitor, all right, and we're going to add the capacitor in the circuit and we are going to change the resonant frequency. Okay, and we're going to do that with all these values, and then again, we're going to take an average of what those are and try to back calculate what the capacitance of the coil is and what the inductance is. And through this, we can actually get a really good accurate measurement of what 
the inductance of this coil is. So let me go ahead and do this um, calculation and I'll guess what the self-resonant frequency is. So I've done the calculation and it comes out that the self-resonant frequency, cal for calculated, uh, using again the inductance and the capacitance here, is 115.21 hertz. That's a really low self-resonant frequency actually. Now the question is, is how are we going to determine this? Well, it's pretty simple, okay? If you have a, let's draw a little graph real quick. So if you have the zero line of your oscilloscope, all right, and you apply some amount of voltage, all right, and then you basically just disconnect everything, but you're measuring voltage, right? You're measuring, um, you're measuring the voltage, so we're going to make this channel 1. You're measuring the voltage, right, across this circuit. So you're basically going to put a switch right here, right, have a battery source, and you're going to close the switch, you're going to charge the inductor with a voltage, right, that's this, and then you're going to just open the circuit back up so all that current can just oscillate in here. So when the magnetic field collapses, it, the coil is going to oscillate, it's going to ring, and it's actually going to look something like that. So just by looking at this oscillation, you can determine the self-resonant frequency. So what we're actually going to do, okay, and I didn't draw this long enough, but we're going to measure, all right, from some point, right, and we're going to look at a few oscillations later, and we're going to measure that point. We're going to take a span of like three or four rings, or three or four oscillations, and we're going to take that and calculate um, what the frequency is. It's better to take more than just one cycle. You're better to take many cycles and do this. So we're going to take many cycles, and we're going to find out what the measurement really is. Now, just real quickly on a side note, you can see and we'll show on the oscilloscope that this rings down and it doesn't continue ringing and why is that? Well in this circuit, right, in this circuit you also have the resistance of the coil, right? In this case it's uh, 45.71k was it? So without this resistance this thing would ring forever and with, with it um, you actually have a dampening effect. Now this is no different than ringing a bell right? The resonant frequency of ringing a bell. This is what we're doing. We're ringing this bell of inductance and capacitance. So let's jump on over and do that. And then we're also going to add these capacitors and we're going to write down here next to each one of these what the calculated self resonant frequency is. Okay. Now before I get started I'll explain this to you as well. Once we add the capacitor, right, we have to take this value of capacitance figure out the self-resonant frequency, but we need to deduce or take away, I should say, the self -res or the, um, the capacitance of the coil. And what that's doing is that allows us to figure out what the real capacitance of the coil is. By adding bigger values than what, it, what is internally here, we can then calculate and figure out what this value actually is. So this might be off a little bit because we're using a measured value which could be wrong. So we're going to do this in many ways again redundantly to get the best value possible. Let's go over to the bench. Alright so I just want to show you the setup. We've got basically two alligator clips going to the coil and then our voltage probes. Now these are high voltage isolated differential probes because this thing rings really really big. Obviously, the more accurate you can measure it, the better. In this case, I don't want to blow up anything, so I'm using a differential uh, isolated probe. Uh, I have four batteries. These are connected um, in series, and they are giving me about 40 volts. They're brand new, so about 10 volts a piece. And then basically, I'm just uh, using this um, uh, mercury switch as a switch. So this is just turns on, turns off. And the reason I'm using this mercury switch is because I want a nice clean on off. Now you can do this with the signal generator set to uh, square wave, which is probably the most common way of doing it. In my case, because the high resistance, um, I really want to get a nice big ring out of it at some voltage that I'm going to be using. 
Obviously, I'm going to be running it a lot higher than this in this case, but I'm using batteries for this case. Signal generator on a square wave usually works just fine. Uh, in my case, I want a big ring. So let's see what we got. Hi, Charlie. So here we go. I'm just going to take this, flick it over so it's got voltage, flick it back, and there was the ring. So it's actually a very large ring. Now I'm going to stop it. All right, so now I can set this down and we'll analyze that a little closer here. Okay, so I have the ability to zoom in on my signal, so I'm just going to set this guy up and zoom in and we can see what we see. Um, now, right off the bat, um, you can see how the signal decays, right? Um, the best way usually is just use your cursors and you can go over here and we'll pick the second the second cycle I should probably zoom in even more on this guy we're gonna pick the flat right in the middle okay you can see the indicator on there and we're gonna take the other one we're gonna go uh, one cycle two cycle three cycle ah, wrong cursor one two three so we're going to go over three, Let's see, one, two, three, yep. We're going to go over three. We're going to try to find the, uh, the same spot on both of them. That's pretty close. Oh, got my cursor set on the wrong value here. We want to put that on, uh, in this case, I can do hertz. You could calculate it out with uh, seconds, but I like having this on hertz. So it's 38.02. So we're going to multiply that by 3 since we're measuring over 3. So we're going to take 38 times 3, and that's going to give us about 114 hertz. Now, our calculated value was 115.21. So it seems that our capacitance and inductance values are pretty darn close. Um, the only, uh, the only like, problem we might run into is if both of them are off and we're still hitting the right frequency that actually could be a problem so just for fun the actual peak to peak of this ring okay with 40 volts input is 3.68 kilovolts 3.6 thousand volts ring back that is a very large ring back for only 40 volts input now a lot of your little coils aren't going to ring back this much they're going to be very small voltages but in this case we have a crap ton of inductance here and so that is a very large ring back uh, just real quickly since I have the ability to zoom in on this uh, I'm going to turn the cursors off okay I'm going to zoom in on the ring itself and so the only things on the screen are what are what's going to be measured and I'm just going to see how close we are um, so here the frequency measured on the oscilloscope is 114. Uh, so it seems to be pretty accurate to do the cursors, but uh, sometimes it's easier just to let the scope do the math for you. Just depends. It's always good to second reference yourself. Um, just so you know, of course, it's always good to do this a few times because each time you do it, you might get a different result. Now, it is important in this case, right, to get, see here, the result is a little different. It's important though to get uh, an average just like we did earlier and kind of figure out the best uh, the best average wins, right? Don't just hope that it's right. Take some averages. Here's a here's a completely different shot. So this time, uh, you know, it's a it's a tiny bit different, but uh, it's always good to do an average like we did earlier. But realistically, it's going to be pretty well the same as long as you don't influence anything from the outside, like additive capacitive capacitance with your hand. If I get my hand close to this thing, just for fun, let's see. I'm going to wrap my hand around this. Let's see if it's any different. All right. Should be pretty well the same, but be surprised at how much, uh, how much you can add capacitance to something. So look, now the average right the frequency is 112.5 just because I put my hand next to it so when you're doing small value components if you've got it sitting on a bench that's aluminum or metal or anything that can add stray capacitance you're gonna completely screw up your your measurement so please keep that in mind so I've added the smallest capacitance value we have 
which is 2.62 nanofarad. And you can see here that our resonance has changed. It's now at 47.76 hertz. And the difference is because of the added capacitance. So we're gonna do this for each one and then go back and do some calculations on uh, what the real values are. So currently I actually have the uh, 249 a nanofarad capacitor on there and you can see the ring is getting kind of hard to measure and actually we're just measuring the bottom peaks here of one cycle. Uh, I just thought it was kind of interesting that it didn't swing in the positive direction anymore it actually stayed below that which is kind of interesting. Uh, just a, something I observed and thought I would show you. So we got two more to do at much higher values and uh, you can see it's going to be actually kind of difficult to measure. So the observation here is that um, even though the ringing doesn't last as long, it's still the same, uh, same decay time, and it's the same de decay time over a over the same distance, which makes it appear like it's dampening faster, but actually it's just the same. The time base here is much bigger now. So here's the very last one with the 0.85 UF capacitor, and you can see um, it dampens real, you know, like it doesn't ring very much. Uh, in, in, in fact, the ring is actually lower than the applied voltage. So it's actually about 26.4 volt is all that it swung back and then it dampened out. So that's due to the resistance. So if we took this coil and hooked it up in a different way, parallel or series, because there's multiple windings on here, we could get that voltage to come back up. Um, and do different things with it. So all kinds of things to think about here. All right, so we've taken all those measurements and we've wrote them all down here. And what I've done is I've taken the added capacitance, so just this capacitance times just this frequency, and I've written down the inductance value. And then what I want to do now is I'm going to take the measured inductance according to our average and the measured frequency at 114 hertz and do the math, all right, and calculate what the capacitance is using this formula. And it, it's about 440 picofarad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 440 picofarad, okay, and I'm going to add it to each one of these values, and I'm going to get a new inductance calculation. I'm going to take that inductance calculation and average it, and that's going to be through multi-processes here, about the closest measurement is what we're going to get. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so what we've done, okay, is we tried to just average a lot of things and figure out where we are. Now, unfortunately, since there's actually quite a few unknown variables, the only thing we actually know is the frequency we measured and the capacitance that we added. So what we did is we uh, took the inductance, okay, here, all right, and the frequency that we measured here, and we got about 444 picofarad, which is pretty close to the 395. So if we add this value, all right, to the bottom three, which are more close to this value, so you gotta remember, when you have a big capacitor and you add it to a very small capacitance, it almost doesn't change the, the frequency here. But when you have a small capacitor and add it, you actually do change the frequency uh, or the inductance a calculation quite a bit. So on the bottom three that it would affect the most, we added the 444. To the top, it doesn't really change anything. So what we did is we took these numbers and these numbers, right? So it's the uh, the frequency and the capacitance, right? Doing the calculation, uh, we can do uh, inductance, which I didn't write up here. I didn't write that formula. So we, we, we did exactly that. We got the inductance values. We took an average and then we took this measured value and this average value and we ended up with about 4,012 Henry. So I don't really know any other best way to do this, but um, you know, this is a ginormous coil, so there's not too many easy ways to do this. But obviously uh, it is possible to average out a lot of things here and get you know, a close value. Now if you're doing a single component, this is pretty complicated. You could probably just measure the self-resonant frequency with a known capacitor of a pretty big value and just do that calculation and it's fine. But I wanted to know what the capacitance of the coil was. So it's somewhere between 440 and 395. 
Um, this measured value could be wrong. It was actually measured with the LRC meter, and I'm not sure if it can measure this properly. So, you know, frequency and measured inductance about 444 picofarad, which is actually a lot smaller than I would expect. I would expect this to have a lot more. So if we screwed something up here and you guys catch it, let me know. But uh, somewhere on the order of 4,000 Henrys, according to this. So that is a bit complicated towards the end here, but the original essence of doing this is pretty straightforward and simple. So hopefully that was interesting and you learned something. All right, read the Bible more. God bless you guys. We're actually going to be using this right here and the scope shots that we took to run this at its resonant frequency. So that's the point of doing this, by the way. Remember what I said in my one of my videos, number 15, I believe it was. Put it in at its resonant frequency, self-resonant frequency, parallel self-resonant frequency. Take it out in its series self-resonant frequency most of the time to uh, to earth and that's exactly the phenomenon that this coil gives you according to all the research of Newman's original so that's pretty cool all right God bless I'm gonna eat some lunch now it is uh, 2 12 2018 we started at uh, I don't know nine o'clock it's about 1230 all right peace and love God bless bye bye thanks Richard for your help